Thank you all for uh, coming uh, today. We intend to go over the information that was gathered as a result of a shooting on East 8th Street near Vista Verda Avenue that on the early morning hours of Sunday, September 22nd, that resulted in the death of Brianne Michelle Sharp. That's S-H-A-R-P-E. Uh, Ms. Sharp's date of birth was July 11th, 1994. At the time of her death, she was age 19. To give an idea as to the, uh, the persons that are involved in this particular case, Ms. Sharp did have an extensive juvenile record starting at age 13. She had a number of fights and batteries upon fellow teens and others, a number of petty thefts, some drug and alcohol issues. Of interest, her first car theft that she was uh, arrested for and placed into the juvenile system was at age 14. She had a second car theft at age 17 on February 23rd, 2012. Uh, that was a stolen truck that she was spotted uh, with with uh, Chico University police that escalated into a fight with those police. <coughs> That fight was captured by Chico ER reporter back in that Febru on the February 23rd date, and she was taken into custody and placed in juvenile hall. The juvenile authorities had done a number of efforts to assist Ms. Sharp, including two out-of-home placements, one up in Reading and one down in the San Jose area. And those uh, placements did not result in her staying very long. Uh, she was an absconder on a number of occasions from those, from those placements. She was eventually placed in the juvenile hall, had a terminal sentence to her age majority or until she was 18. Uh, after she turned 18, on February 23rd, of 2013, this year there was yet another auto theft. This was her third auto theft of which she was accused and later convicted. This was of a stolen VW Jetta, stolen out of Chico, and of interest because of the similarities to the event that we we're about to talk about that happened here recently. The victim, the owner of that particular car, and left a spare key in the car that was obviously used to steal, steal the vehicle out of the Diamond Hotel parking lot. The vehicle had been reported and was seen being driven uh, by Sheriff's by Ms. Sharp, by Sheriff's deputy in the Magalia area. The Sheriff's deputy then attempted to stop the car the pursuit wound around back roads, back way into Forest Ranch and onto the Skyway with speeds up to 80 miles an hour. Pursuit uh, continued onto Highway 32, down into Chico at speeds of uh, over 100 miles an hour. Highway Patrol put out a spike strip of the 10 mile house trail on Highway 32. Uh, the spike strip was indicated to be effective at least on some of the tire, tire or tires. However, the car continued for an additional four miles until Chico police was able to put a, st a spike strip on Highway 32 at the old Humboldt Road intersection. It was estimated that uh, Ms. Sharp in the car hit that spike strip, strip at an estimated 120 miles an hour. Continued yet another three miles 
all tires flattened to Yosemite Drive, where the <coughs> pursuit was finally ended. She was arrested, and a 20-year-old male passenger had ran out of the car and was later captured in the area with the use of CHP helicopter and a, <coughs> and a dog. Uh, Ms. Sharp was convicted of felony evading and the, because the auto theft portion of that crime was dismissed with a waiver from her allowing that that charge be considered at sentencing. She was sentenced on April 18th, 2013. My office asked for prison for her because this was her third auto theft and because of her extensive juvenile record. Probation department had recommended that she be given one last final chance at turning her life around. The judge went along with that recommendation and gave Ms. Sharp three years formal probation with a condition of 120 days in the county jail. This is a picture of Ms. Sharp's booking photo as she appeared back on February 23rd. Uh, at the arrest of that high-speed chase. Uh, after uh, she was sentenced in April uh, 23rd, or pardon me, April 18th on April 23rd, she was released from the Butte County Jail, having served the full extent of the uh, probationary jail sentence. At that time, uh, she had contact with her probation officer, but stopped contact with that probation officer in June of this year. The officer attempted to find Ms. Sharp at her last known address in the Megalia area, also made contact uh, with a number of phone uh, numbers that uh, she had given the probation department. All failed to produce Ms. Sharp, the officer then in July, probation officer in July, then filed a violation of probation. And on July 25th of this year, uh, Butte County Superior Court judge revoked her probation and issued a no bail bench warrant, which was still outstanding at the time of her uh, death. <coughs> the involved officers, Involved officers are Officer Scott Zushin and as Sergeant Scott Zushin, who's had 15 years in law enforcement, uh, 10 years with Chico Police Department. Uh, he, and as we will see on the, uh, the photos and the video reenactment, it was in the Chico PD Sergeant's SUV uh, C26. Sergeant Zushin expended or shot four times at uh, Ms. Sharp in her vehicle. Officer Damon Selen, or Selen, pardon me, Dr. Or, uh, Damon Selen, uh, who has been with Chico Police Department seven years. He was in car C16 that night. He was also using a nine millimeter handgun and expended three rounds. Officer Nick Vega, uh, three years with Chico Police Department in car C-27 that night. He expended eight rounds from his nine millimeter uh, handgun. Who is that, Mike, I'm sorry? That is Officer Nick Vega. Hey. Yeah, that is in the, the uh, letter that you should have. Jared, Com Officer Jared Cumber, Nine years of law enforcement experience, four years with the Chico Police Department in car C3, and with a uh, his sidearm and that night is a 45 caliber uh, handgun. He expended one round. Officer David Quigley, four years with the Chico Police Department, car C8 and he expended three rounds from his 45 caliber handgun. Other officers that were involved in pursuit and at the scene were uh, Ed Marshall, 
Greg Rogers, and Tony Ferreira. Uh, Officer Ferreira was doubled up in Officer Cumber's car uh, that night, and we'll see that in, a, in just a bit. Uh, about 1.55 that, uh, that morning, 1.55 a.m., Chico Dispatch Center received a call uh, from a citizen over on the Coit Tower Way uh, neighborhood in Chico. Uh, this is off of uh, Bruce and East 8th Street, and indicating that there was a white male adult, about six feet, uh, shaved head, uh, that was in the neighborhood and was trying door handles as they walked down, down the street. The citizen felt that this was criminal activity afoot and Chico Police Department then dispatched Officer Marshall and Officer Vega to that neighborhood to see if they could find the uh, suspect that was trying those, those door handles. Uh, Officer Marshall came in from the north. Officer Vega came in from the south. They patrolled for a few minutes in that area, but were unable to find anyone uh, on foot at all in that particular area. But as they were looking in that area, Officer Marshall then saw a night of black 1995 Honda Civic Del Sol, uh, the Honda Civic Del Sol uh, two-door, somewhat uh, sports car type of uh, car, and he noticed it in that neighborhood, noticed that the right rear brake light had been broken out, and white light shining, shining back, a violation of the vehicle code. <coughs> He determined to stop the car for that violation, but also because his suspicion was that the car very well may be an unreported stolen vehicle because it was driving in that quiet residential area. And Honda cars are the car of choice in the Chico area for being stolen. In the last 100 days, on that day, there had been some 27 Honda vehicles that had been stolen in the Chico area. He turned around, and on Coit Tower Way, followed the car until it reached East 8th Street. When the car started to turn on left on East 8th Street, going generally in the westerly direction, he then turned on his red lights, and the car failed to yield. Within about 100 feet, he turned on his siren. The car then sped up in this 25 mile an hour zone to 50 plus miles an hour. And as the chase well, and the pursuit continued, went through one, two, three, pardon me, one, two, three stoplights. That pursuit was being uh, channeled through the dispatch center. Officers that were at Chico Police Department and Officer Vega, who is now on Highway 32, knew that East 8th Street would come out down actually near their station on Highway 32. As the pursuit came down East 8th, the black Honda made a turn Again, going through the third stop sign at that intersection and turned south on Alpine Street. Alpine Street leads to Vista Verde uh, Lane or Avenue, 
which is basically a you know, is a private street that is actually more of a pathway through a number of parking lots for several large apartment complexes that are in the area that I'm circling right now. This pathway has a number of speed bumps, but as our officer marshal was behind the car and continued to pick up speed, getting now 40 miles an hour in this speed bump area, and as the officer said, was flying over uh, the speed bumps. Officers are responding at this point from the Chico Police Department, which is basically just off the map that is being shown, and coming up Fur Street to intersect with East 8th Street. As Officer Marshall continued his pursuit of the <coughs> black Honda in the first of an S curve right at this area, on Vista Verde Avenue. The car crashed or collided with a six inch high uh, curb that uh, then impacted its uh, left front wheel and bumper and stopped the car. Officer Marshall began to pull his car up behind the black Honda thinking that the pursuit was now over uh, where the car immediately reversed <coughs> and continued forward through the s curves, now picking up even more speed, getting up to the 40 miles an hour that it had before, coming out of Vista Verde onto East 8th <coughs> Street. As you can see, this shows even more that's really more a series of parking lots that are connected by this path. Came out on Vista Verde past one of the responding Chico Police Department cars that had turned onto Vista Verde from East uh, 8th Street, and that was Officer Cumber's car, passed, came out onto the roadway crossed the roadway from the south to the north, completely on over, over the curb, over the sidewalk area in a wide arcing and very uh, quick and dangerous turn that then came down in front of Sergeant Zushin's patrol SUV that was parked generally <coughs> in this area just before a power pool as the car regained traction, regained uh, a straighter vector that came just in front of Sergeant Zushin's SUV and crashed into a pole. Generally, after crashing into this pole, Sergeant Zushin then approached the vehicle from the rear. As Sergeant Zushin approached the vehicle from the rear, anticipating that he would be taking the person out of the car on a felony stop, that uh, he had drawn his weapon. As he approached within 10, or about 15 to 20 feet of the car, he saw the white backup lights suddenly come on and start to back towards it. Sergeant Zushin was in what we call a kill box at that time. To his right was a landscaped mound and shrubbery, so he could not go to his right. To his left was <coughs> Officer Marshall's pursuing vehicle that had come up to that area at the time. Sergeant Zushin then fired his weapon and fired his weapon at the back headrest of the car to disable the driver that he was in fear of coming back and running over him. The time that the car stopped its rear motion, it was, uh, according to the later forensic 
uh, measurements, and we'll go through this in a little more detail in a moment, was uh, approximately five feet from striking Sergeant <coughs> Zushin. Car then, at, after Sergeant Zushin then fired the first of two, two rounds, started forward. Sergeant Zushin fired two more rounds as the car made a wide, sweeping U-turn, coming back to the officers that had now stacked up in this area uh, with their car. <coughs> Officer uh, uh, Selling was nearby the, a tree. Again, we'll go through this in a moment. And his, uh, he saw the car then make that tight U-turn. All officers and neighbors in the area commented that the car was uh, at full acceleration, full revving, uh, full RPMs as it came through that curve, hit a tree just to the left of uh, Officer Selman's car, causing Officer Selman to kind of jump to his right and fire three times. Car, or the Black Honda continuing hitting Officer Sellen, side of Officer Sellen's car. Officer Vega parks uh, slightly behind and to the right of <coughs> Officer Sellen's car, saw the car now bearing down on him. He fired eight times with his, his weapons trying to disable the car. Behind him, uh, and slightly to his right, Officer Cumber, as the driver, Officer Ferreira's car, saw that the uh, black Honda was now bearing down on the car behind them, Officer Quigley's car. Officer Cumber out in the street, as all of these officers were outside of their cars at this time, fired one round from his 45. Officer Quigley, the last car in the stack, saw the car bearing down on him. He moved to his, to his right and engaged fire at the same time the car was bearing down on him and was able to avoid the car hitting him. However, it did uh, strike the driver's side, uh, all the way down the driver's side of Officer Quigley's car and then finally stopped behind Officer Quigley's car on the curb. The car was severely damaged, but the engine was still revving at that point. Officer Sushin then gathered an arrest team, gathered behind Officer, in the front of Officer Quigley's car for cover, <coughs> asked that the person come out of the car, demanded that the person come out of the car. There was no response. Uh, they received and got, or they uh, retrieved from Sergeant Zushin's car a ballistic shield, and officers then approached the, the black <coughs> Honda. When they approached the black Honda, uh, they saw a non-responsive female in the driver's side seat, uh, saw no one else in the car. They were able then to pull her out, lay her down, and at that point, the uh, <coughs> officer uh, with paramedic training, Officer Jim Dimmon, arrived at the scene and began immediate uh, medical life-saving proceedings, <coughs> including uh, CPR. Officers had noted shallow breathing and slight pulse. Uh, the breathing stopped just as medics were loading uh, Ms. Sharp into the ambulance. Officer Dimmitt continued CPR into the back of the ambulance, in the ambulance, and on to Inlow Hospital. When she arrived at Inlow Hospital, within a few minutes after her arrival, doctors pronounced her dead. The, uh, in the autopsy, it was determined that uh, Ms. Sharp had suffered two devastating wounds. One was in the back but behind the right ear, slightly above the right ear, to the back of the, of the skull. The other was to the upper right arm, or pardon me, upper left arm, 
uh, shoulder area, which had passed into the chest. As a result of looking ballistically at the uh, bullets that were found in her head and into her chest, it was determined that the bullet in the head was from Officer Zushin's gun, and the bullet that had passed through her arm into her chest was from Officer Vega's gun. Uh, as the officer involved shooting protocol team was called out that night, we'll explain just a little bit about that process. This process has been in place now for almost a couple of decades uh, in the Butte County area. It consists of representatives that are called out from each of the law enforcement agencies in Butte County. Its purpose is to examine officer involved or critical incident critical incidents to make sure that the public has a full, fair, unbiased investigation. Naturally, folks would be concerned if the shooting agency, in this case Chief of Police Department, was to do its own investigation of itself. That is why we have officers from all of the other agencies and state agencies that come and convene, all look at the scene, and then start talking to witnesses, gathering evidence, and seeing what exactly did happen. We were very uh, fortunate to use some of our newer technology that night. Part of that newer technology is some um, rather uh, advanced uh, laser uh, survey equipment that takes a number of data points, evidence points, and loads that all into a software program that can then give us an idea through animation as to what happened that particular morning. We'll go ahead and give just a view first of uh, what the aftermath of this uh, particular collision and shooting looked like the next, the next morning. You can see the black Honda had suffered extensive damage uh, to the front of the vehicle from hitting this power pole that you see in the back. You can see the lineup here of the police vehicles that had responded to that area. This is Officer uh, Quigley's car, Officer Cumber's car, Officer Vega's car, Officer Sellin's car, Sergeant Zushin's car, and go to the next a little higher view. You can see again where the car is here, the black Honda, in C8, that being Officer Quigley's car, Officer Cumber's car, and you notice it's at the mouth of Vista Verde. Here, here is Officer Vega's car, Officer Sellin's car, Officer Rogers' car, Sergeant Sushin's car, Officer Marshall's car, and again up here is that, that pole. Going yet to a higher perspective, this was taken later that day uh, through the use of the New County Sheriff's Office helicopter, and you can see how the scene was laid out with those officers' cars and the black Honda as they stopped at the end of this particular particular incident. Let me bring that up. Yeah, there you go. Let's see 
that this is Vista Verde. <coughs> this is how it looked in terms of the computer uh, recreation. As you can see, the computer recreation here shows us where those, those cars are. The computer has these exact type of cars as part of the software program. <coughs> so we have these police cars of that weight, that vintage, that year, that are in the program. And as you can see, this is a, a replica of uh, what we saw from the helicopter. This allows, this program allows us to take a look uh, in 3D view from any area in this area so that we can see the, the viewpoint of anyone uh, that is at any place on that particular, uh, particular scene. As you can also see, these are skid marks and brush marks that show the direction of the car, the black Honda, as it came, crashed, backed up, and then came back around. As you see, the pointer coming down towards the cars and eventually ending, ending here. Those skid marks, those uh, brush marks, those uh, marks from flattened tires are were clearly visible that night and are accurately to within several hundredths of an inch defined into the uh, software program. <coughs> we'll go ahead now and as a result of all of the investigation, you see now the car coming, Officer Marshall coming, coming in front of Officer Zushin's car, crashing, uh, backing up into Officer Zushin. Shots comes around. Here we have hitting the various officers and coming at the officers. That is real time. That is based upon the evidence, physical evidence. To try and slow it down just a bit, this will be half speed. So we can see that the car is coming up. Officer Cumber's vehicle was going in. Officer Marshall's car coming up. Officer Sergeant Zushin is already there, out of his vehicle. Just barely misses him. The other cars, the patrol cars are coming. Officer Cumber coming back out. Uh, Officer uh, uh, Quigley uh, coming. Again, another perspective. As this car comes out, leaving these skid marks, comes out, just barely misses. Officer, or pardon me, Sergeant Zushin hits that particular uh, pole. And as the officers now stack up, thinking that the pursuit is over at this point and are all getting out of their cars. Looking straight down just to Verde Avenue, car out, over. Owns, crashes into the pole again. Officer Zushin right there. Officers, our animation is not Grand Theft Auto, so we can't have people jumping out of cars, doors opening. And so forth. Again, here's an aerial perspective. Again, at half speed. So that, and this was all over within a very few seconds. This is the backup. Here is Officer, or pardon me, Sergeant Sushin. Another perspective of the same, same thing. Some more aerial perspectives using the software program to basically fly over the scene. As we see the car come, come at Officer Sellen, Officer Vega, Officer Cumber, and Officer Quigley. initially and then finally stop there as a result of the mechanics of the vehicle being broken to the point that it 
and stop on its own. Another perspective, again, a long shot perspective, half speed, again, pointing out all of these skid marks that were there. And we're left largely uh, because of the speed and flat uh, nature of the, of the uh, tires. I know that flat nature of the tires because I was asked why didn't the police just shoot out the tires? Or frankly, there's no tires left to shoot out. <coughs> another, uh, another perspective, you can see this tree that went down. It's about a six inch in diameter uh, tree. These are from the various officer perspectives at this point. Officer Rogers, who had come into the, the scene and had seen the cars just drive just in front of him, the cars being the suspect vehicle, the black Honda, and Officer Marshall's vehicle, pulled up. Another officer came by him, eventually ended up in this area. This is Sergeant Sushin. I was there. Sergeant Sushin, and talking to him as this car came back, as we say, within five feet of the back bumper and five feet of where he was standing. Sergeant Sushin did say, in fear of his life, nowhere to go, car over in this direction, preventing him from going here, the shrubbery in a landscape mound preventing him from going here and not able to go fast enough to go back. Got his sight picture as the rear or the driver's side headrest which he could see from the street light that was in front of the car shining here. He could not see the driver uh, or the driver's head but could see the raised head rest and that was his target. And then again from Sergeant Zushin's position of how the car goes. Again from Officer Rogers' uh, perspective as he had pulled, pulled up Some of, of significance uh, with Officer Marshall, Officer Rogers, and Officer Ferreira. We'll see a little bit more here. All three of these officers were non-shooting officers. And there was a reason they were non-shooting officers. They were non-shooting officers because they were not personally in a position to be run over or harmed by this 2,000-pound car. Uh, they stuck to their training just as the shooting officers stuck to their training that the car was not an immediate threat to them, was not an immediate threat to officers that were directly around them, so they held their fire. The officers that shot, as it will become clear as we continue with the officer's perspective, were in fear of their life or officers right near them. Go ahead with it. <clears throat> this is Officer Sellen. This car comes to him. That is how close it passed by Officer Sellen. That is real time. <coughs> that is the tree that also fell on his car in the side of his car that got hit by the black Honda. Officer Vega, right behind Officer Selling, sees Officer Selling cars get hit, tree come down, and the car comes extraordinarily close to him. He was outside, right, Mike? Yes. Okay. All officers were outside their cars, anticipating that they were going to take the car down that had crashed into the pole. Gotcha. This is Officer Cumber. Officer Cumber. 
uh, came close to him, but he was more concerned about the officer, Officer Quigley, that he had seen come up behind him and had seen the car going directly towards Officer Quigley. He had gotten off the one route. Officer Quigley saw the car coming directly at him, hit his car, eventually stopped there. He shot as the car was coming, coming at him. <clears throat> coming at him. This is some of the layering that is possible in, in this program. As you see these little yellow marks here, these are the casings that were at the, at the scene, not the casings, but where the casings were, and the skid marks. Using that, using where the vehicles are, using the, the impact on the Honda, uh, able to use all those data points to put into a compilation of this evidence to show where everyone was at the time of the separate officers' shootings. <coughs> And you see some of the skid marks. Uh, very useful to have the Highway Patrol mate team from Sacramento uh, to help interpret what these, these skid marks meant as the crash and then the rapid acceleration backwards. And actually, you see right here, it came up into this high uh, mound area before it crashed into the into the pool. This is the survey crime evidence gathering uh, laser tool. These are just part of the data data points that were gathered at at the scene. In more, as you can see, the data points which are collected in 3D space. Each one of these means something in terms of the full data of this of this particular uh, scene. 